Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Wonderful to be with you all today. Yes, we live in a world that has lost its mind. This is for sure. Just lost their mind. Lost their mind. But that's the world. It was on Fox News that there was a university in the East Coast that <coughs> is installing female hygiene product dispensers in the men's laboratories. <laughs> lost their mind. The world has lost its mind. But that's the world. They were nuts anyway. Before we knew Jesus, we were crazy. At least I was. If you don't believe me, <laughs> anyway. But when the church loses its mind, then we've got a bigger problem. I don't want this recorded. I don't want to go to church. <laughs> Bien. But when the church loses its mind, things become dire. You look at some of the things that are being propagated. The whole Bill Johnson thing, or the IHOP thing, or the Hillsong thing, it's just these are people who say they're saved. And they think the insanity to which they subscribe is somehow scriptural. And it's getting worse. But to anyone who reads the word of God, the insanity is obviously setting the stage for prophetic events the word of God says were going to happen. I've always been of a charismatic Pentecostal persuasion in a moderate sense. I always believed in spirit baptism, scripturally understood. I've always believed in the gifts of the spirit, the charismatic gifts manifested and exercised scripturally. I don't think most of what we see or have seen is scriptural, but I certainly don't deny what's in the word of God. And I certainly don't believe these things ended with the apostles. But at one time, I could have said comfortably and safely that 90% of the lunatic born-again Christians or lunatic evangelicals, whatever that term means anymore, were among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals. I can't say that anymore. Now, they've all lost the plot. I'm not saying that we're the only ones who are right, by no means. What I am saying is this. We have reached a point in the history of the church as we draw closer to the return of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is doing something. I first noticed this in the 1970s as a fairly young believer, but I was praying earnestly, and I believed the Lord spoke to me then, and I don't go around getting prophecies or revelations every 10 minutes or every two weeks. But I do believe the Lord spoke to me then, through prayer. And this was when churches in the United States, I was just about to immigrate to Israel, but it's when churches in the United States were canceling their midweek Bible studies in the church and breaking up into home groups. They began having midweek home group meetings instead of midweek Bible studies. And I knew at that time, I knew the Lord said, this is my spirit preparing my people for a coming persecution. You're not going to be able to have these buildings someday. I knew that back in the 70s. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who did, but I, I stand by what I believe the Lord showed me. This is my spirit preparing the church for what is going to come. And they're going to do it. If you won't put feminine hygiene dispensers, a product dispensers, in the gentleman's lavatory, they're going to say that you are not in compliance with 
the state laws concerning transgenderism, gay, lesbian, gender, whatever the thing is, and therefore your building is no longer tax exempt. They're going to do things like that. They already have a published agenda to do it. ACLU will be coming after Christians, I guarantee it. It's going to come to that. And instead of seeing it to what it is, you've got major evangelical leaders caving in on it and going along with it. The leader of Hillsong in New York, or Tony Campola, they're going along with it. Others are just avoiding the issue. You can take almost anything. Now, I'm only stating facts. I'm not attacking people. I am stating facts. Let's just take one issue, just one. You've heard me say many times, perhaps, that I accept the fact that different believers will place the rapture at a different point in the sequence of prophetic events. We said that. I have a big problem with people who say there is no rapture. Huge problem with people who deny the doctrine of the rapture. And there are people doing it. Rick Joyner's people, Mike Bickle says the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. This, this false teacher in England, Gerald Coates, is a fantasy and a myth. I mean, I've got a big problem with people who deny the truth of the doctrine of the rapture. But I've always accepted the fact that different people who, like myself, are premillennialists, convinced premillennialists, and who, like myself, firmly believe in the doctrine of the rapture, will place it at a different point. Is it an important issue? It's a very important issue. It's important for discussion, not for division. We should come together in the spirit of Christian fellowship and deal with it. Theological forums, symposiums, even debates. But we shouldn't be dividing. People who believe in the rapture shouldn't divide over. My problem was with people who deny the rapture. My problem is with people like Rick Warren who say, avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. Jesus said, be alert, watch out for these things. Rick Warren teaches, keep away from it. You either listen to Rick Warren or Jesus Christ, but half the church, at least half, is listening to Rick Warren and rejecting Jesus. The Calvary Chapel movement, so much of it, no longer believes what Chuck Smith once did. I knew Chuck Smith. Most of his beliefs were very much along the same lines as my own, essentially. Something's happening. But people have made it a fundamental. Now let's look at the realities. I'm only stating facts. I'm not here to throw mud. I'm here to state facts. I was a friend of the late Tim LaHaye. I liked him as a person. I think he did a lot of good. I think God used him in many respects. And uh, I did conferences with him. He was not a man I disliked. But there's no getting around the fact. And I went to him about this. Jesus said there'll be many antichrists, people who are in place of Christ and against Christ, one of which was the cult leader, Sun Young Moon from South Korea. He wrote the book, The Divine Principle. He claimed to be the Lord of the Second Advent, in other words, the return of Christ. He said and Jesus failed in his, first, in his mission. Now Moon has come to succeed where Jesus has failed. And he said his wife was the Holy Spirit. Now, I know Christians who were saved out of the Unification Church, his cult. They all said it was a mind control cult based on money. The chap who runs our ministry in Japan, Moriel Japan, was in it. And I know other Christians who were in it. This guy was an antichrist, a self-confessed antichrist. By the way, his cult owned the Washington Times, the conservative Republican newspaper. But because his politics were right, people went along with him. It, it, right in their view. Now, I'm only stating a fact. When Moon was finally criminally convicted of fraud and sent to federal prison in this country, Tim LaHaye attempted to publicly organize 300 evangelical leaders to volunteer to go to federal prison in support of Reverend Moon in solidarity with Sun Young Moon with an antichrist. This is Tim LaHaye. This is insanity. Jerry Falwell, 
We got a couple of million bucks for Liberty University from Sun Young Moon, and on a platform, embraced him as an unsung hero. A man who says he's the return of Jesus Christ and his wife is the Holy Spirit was a hero in Liberty University. And people like Ed Hinson went along with it and didn't do anything. He's a professor there. But Tim LaHaye is pre-trib, so he's all right. That covers the multitude of sin. So what if he said we should go to prison in solidarity with an antichrist? He's pre-trib, he's, he's all right. So what if Jerry Falwell took a couple of million bucks from this guy and said he's a hero? He's all right. He's pre-trib. Jerry Falwell's pre-trib. He's all right. That becomes the certificate of approval. Let's go further. Again, I'm only stating facts. There is very little scope for divorce and remarriage among believers. If you, have an un if you get saved and you have an unbelieving partner, a wife or a husband who leaves you and goes off with another and marries them, we can look at that. Or if something happened before somebody was born again and, and then they got married and then they got saved, you can look at that. But the notion of two believers getting divorced, <clears throat> that was unthinkable 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I didn't know any Christians who did that. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody who did that. That was the Hollywood. The main pre-trib author in the world, Hal Lindsey's on his fifth marriage. His fifth! But that's okay, he's pre-trib. The pre-trib leader, David Reagan. You can go on YouTube and listen to him. If there's a such place as eternal hell, God is not a God of justice. His arguments for annihilationism, you can make Swiss cheese out of. He's an annihilationist. But that's okay, he's acceptable because he's pre-trib. That's the seal of approval. Thomas Ice, who says that the apostasy, the great apostasy, is not a falling away, but it's the rapture, <laughs> denies that there are any prophetic events heralding the return of Jesus. The rebirth of Israel, these things do not fulfill prophecy. That's his view of imminency. Oh, but that's okay. He doesn't believe these world events are actually fulfilling prophecy and setting the stage for the return of Jesus. He just thinks the return of Jesus is so imminent there's no signs of... But wait a minute, he's on a platform with all these other guys who were saying Israel fulfills prophecy. And so... Oh, but that's okay. He's pre-trib. It's all right. Even other pre-trib people say his view that the apostasy is the rapture is... is, is <laughs> daft. But he's pre trip is all right. Then you've got John MacArthur and others like him. Jimmy DeYoung, now a Calvary Chapel guy, Terry, Tommy Ryan. It'll be possible to worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, and still be saved. What does Revelation 14, 11 say? It couldn't get much clearer. And the smoke of their torment goes up, and yow tau and yow nay. It doesn't sound like annihilationism to me. They have no rest. Day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. John MacArthur says, forget that. Jimmy D. Young says, forget that. John MacArthur's on the warpath against anybody who is not a cessationist, who believes in the gifts of the Spirit. He's on the warpath against them. Yeah, he himself has become a, a rank false teacher. Phil Johnson, Jimmy D. Young, John MacArthur, these men are false teachers. What they're teaching is dangerous. Revelation chapter 20. Those who had not worshipped the beast or the image and had not received the mark on their forehead and upon their hand, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Forget that, says uh, John MacArthur. 
But that's okay. As long as he's pre-trib, he's one of us. He's a good brother. <laughs> you understand this is across the board? These are people going at the blatantly false doctrine. Embracing publicly supporting self-confessed antichrists. People living immorally. Living in what Jesus called adulterous marriages. Serial adultery. Annihilationists. Heretics of every description. Personally immoral people. You sell the film rights to the Left Behind series to secular Hollywood producers who make grade B movies with unsaved movie stars, and then they're marketing video games and computer games about the rapture to unsaved people. Oh, you have a critical spirit. <laughs> when the world has lost its mind, the world didn't have much of a mind to begin with. When the church has lost its mind, we got a problem. We got a problem. You see what they're, they're making that the basis of fellowship. Then we get into the ecumenical issue. You get in bed with the Pope, I've been saying this for years, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama. There's no stopping it. They have these papal conclaves where he gets together with the witch doctors and the Buddhist monks and the Dalai Lama and the whatever. And then you've got Rick Warren's global peace plan, where we have to unite with people who worship other gods, like Hindus and Muslims and whoever, even though we don't agree with them, even though they worship other gods, who Moses and Paul calls demons. We have to unite with them to bring in global peace. That is flatly the agenda of the Antichrist, to unite the world's false religions to bring in a false peace. This is openly Antichrist. Nobody has any problem with it. Unbelievable. I think of the late Chuck Colson. His wife was a Catholic. He, can, he drafted the Concordat, Catholics and Evangelicals together. Getting major evangelical leaders to sign it, and they did, including people you never would have thought would have signed it, like that... Dr. Kent from the Church of the Nazarene, other evangelicals signed it, agreeing not to evangelize Roman Catholics because they're believers. How many people here used to be Roman Catholic? Look around. Aren't you glad somebody told you that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin and you don't have to atone in purgatory for your own? Aren't you glad somebody told you that salvation comes from second birth, not from sacraments? You've got Catholic family and friends on their way to eternal perdition without Christ trusting in scapulas and mass cards. And major evangelical leaders are signing Chuck Colson's agreement not to evangelize Catholics. Colson, J.I. Packer, the reformed Calvinist theologian from Regents College in Vancouver and a number of other major evangelicals, even scholars, even theologians endorsed Peter Kreef's book, Ecumenical Jihad. We have to unite with Islam to morally redeem society. This is craziness. These are people who say they're saved. These are major evangelical leaders. It's over. The future is going to be house churches and independent fellowships like this one. It's mainstream denominational churches. I wish I could find a single movement that has not lost its mind. At one time, I had hope for Calvary chapels. Not anymore. There are individual good Calvary chapels, yes. But the movement as a whole, once Chuck Smith went, all the error that was building up just avalanched. No stopping it now. I'm only telling the truth. Got a Skype from New Zealand last night. 
Some Memorial people planted a new church near Auckland. Just began 30 people in it. These things are springing up all over the place. People cannot find biblically-based churches where they live, so they're meeting in homes and things like that. They've had it. They're getting fed up. But it's not what they're doing. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Look with me, please, today to the eviction of Tobiah. The eviction of Tobiah. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> we are told in the book of Revelation something that we highlight repeatedly. We reiterate it often. The dragon and the serpent are cast down to you. It's the dragon and the serpent. When Satan attacks via persecution, that is the dragon. But the serpent beguiled the woman. And the last days, the church will be attacked both externally and internally. You can identify the dragon, but the serpent is subtle. The serpent beguiled the woman. Paul writes about this at some length in 2 Corinthians, doesn't he? I'm afraid you're going to get seduced. He's writing to Christians the way that Eve did. Well, let's look. Tobiah. It begins with somebody who has a good name. Tobiah. Tuvia in Hebrew, which means Yahweh is good or the goodness of Yahweh. Tuvia. Tobiah. Latinized Tobias. Tuvia. The goodness of God. Same name as the lead character in Fiddler on the Roof. It's a nice name in Hebrew. It means something nice. Yahweh is good. God is good. The goodness of God. Remember, the enemy always comes as an angel of light. He knows how to package the product. The Antichrist is going to counterfeit Christ. The spirit of Antichrist counterfeits the working of the Holy Spirit. The enemy has a lot of experience in camouflage. He knows how to, pa how to package his product. And it begins with a good name. Let's go on. Chapter 2, verse 10. And when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite... Arab descent, an Arab, official heard about it. It was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. The guy is an enemy with an agenda. He has a good name, but he's an enemy with an agenda. Now Ezra and Nehemiah following Haggai it's a story of revival, isn't it, after the Babylonian captivity. They teach about the patterns of revival, those books. And, of course, we see the patterns of revival found in Scripture, and particularly in Ezra and Nehemiah, most conspicuously. We understand the counterfeit nature of what's being marketed as revival today by the tele-evangelists or by counterfeit revivals in Pensacola and Toronto. It doesn't fit the pattern. Nonetheless, <clears throat> whenever there's a move of God, and remember, revival is not a lot of people getting saved. A lot of people getting saved is the result of revival. It's not revival. You can't revive that which was never alive. It's the people of God repenting and returning to their first love and God pouring his spirit upon it, and then the growth you see is a result of it. Well, 
righteousness. Uh, whenever there's a move of God, the enemy will try to destroy it one way or another. Let's look at two works of God that the enemy infiltrated and tried to destroy from within. Not far from here, across the street from the area of Los Angeles known as Little Tokyo is Azusa Street, not far from downtown LA. Birthplace of American Pentecostalism. There had been predecessors of it with the Irvingites in Britain. There had been similar things in Australia with the Sunshine Revivals and in the north of England with Smith Wigglesworth and in Armenia where Damon Shakarian's family came from. There had been other places, but the, in this country, the main one was Azusa Street. I do not deny it began right, but at a very early stage, these people like Mr. Seymour, Mr. Palmer, they began going way off the rails. However, there were people who came along in America and in Britain, particularly Scotland, and they threw grain into the toxic stew. Okay. They brought the word of God into the situation and corrected much of what was wrong with early Pentecostalism. Satan did not succeed to destroy it. He continued to try. He raised up people later like William Branham and E.W. Kenyon, but the mainstream Pentecostal movements like the Assemblies of God were quite biblically grounded in those days, and they rejected such things. Today, they embrace what they once rejected. In fact, they, in many cases, become what they once rejected. No wonder they're on their way out. Nonetheless, when you see a move of God, Satan's going to hit it. I got saved in a revival among hippies. The groups of hippies, we, coming from the drug culture of the 1960s, we never would have gotten saved in a Billy Graham crusade or something like that. We were all extremely left-wing in our politics, involved in, in psychedelic drugs. We had guys coming back from Vietnam strung out on heroin. It was no way the, the established church could have no power, no means. There was a move of God's spirit among the hippies. The hippie groups that remained alone, such as the Children of God, the one I got saved through, and Bible Speaks, and the Church of Bible Understanding, and Jesus People USA, those things became cults. But there were other people in the more established churches who reached out to the hippies. They were rejected. You couldn't go to Moody Bible Institute unless you agreed to get a haircut and shave your beard and mustache if you were a hippie. I, I remember the absurdity, the hypocrisy, the ridiculous hypocrisy of Moody Bible Institute. Inside the first page, you cannot have long hair at all to, to go to, and on the picture of R.A. Torrey and D.L. Moody on the front cover with long hair and beard. I said, D.L. Moody can't go to Moody Bible Institute, I'm not going either. <laughs> the utter hypocrisy of the established church had no capacity to reach these kids who were disillusioned. They were legitimately disillusioned. You had black guys coming home from Vietnam who couldn't go to university in Alabama or Mississippi at that time. And churches who said they were born again, the Calvinistic churches of the South, supporting this. <laughs> It, this was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. They were drafting kids and young people who had no right to vote at that time, sending them to Vietnam. <clears throat> and then they had detente. They, they were trading with China and Russia while China and Russia were equipping the North Vietnamese to kill Americans. And then they were saying, if you don't go fight the communists that we're trading with, you're a, you're, you're, you're a traitor, you're a coward. My generation was sickened by the establishment and the corruption of our government and even of our denominations. But we didn't find love and truth by taking LSD or psychedelic drugs. All we found was addiction, <laughs> overdoses, sexually transmitted diseases, and the rest of it. 
God's spirit moving among the hippies. <laughs> I saw guys coming back from Vietnam totally strung out on heroin. They were going to the VA clinic in LA on 120 milligrams of methadone a day. Getting saved, no cold turkey. Just not one or two droves of them. I saw it. There was a move of God's spirit. The established churches didn't want these kids in because the way they looked and all this and what they came from, you know, I guess Jesus had long hair. They didn't like him either, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but there was people, you know, they were the, he's the Jesus of our suburban Protestant middle class, not of you hippies, you know. Well, Chuck Smith didn't see it that way. <laughs> Thank God. Marsh Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, didn't see it that way. Actually, initially he did, but he said the Lord convicted him. <laughs> they reached out. Now, these hippie groups, they had weird ideas and they're crazy, and some of them became cults, but others, people reached out to them. Of course, when they did, they were rejected by the mainstream denominations for doing it. Marsh Rosen lost his position with the Jewish mission organization he was with, and Chuck Smith was disowned by the Foursquare Pentecostal Church. <laughs> Whenever there's a move, Satan is going to try to destroy it. You got the charismatic movement, the renewal. Unfortunately, nobody put the grain into the toxic stew, and it's come to nothing. You got people... Catholics, charismatic Catholics were praying in tongues to Mary. Oh, that's okay. As long as they're praying in tongues, they're saved and they're all right. This is what was happening. Unbelievable. There were other problems with the charismatic movement as well. But doctrine was sacrificed for the sake of a false unity. Satan will always attack a move of God. This was no different. And so we have Sanballat, obviously. We have other nefarious characters. Not only the Horonite, but Tobias. Let's continue. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1. Now it came about when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah to Geshem the Arab and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and no breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors of the gates. That Sambalat and Geshem sent a messenger to me, come let us meet together at Sephrim in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. Be careful when the religious establishment talks to you about things like Dialogue. <laughs> when they couldn't stop them from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and the temple, they tried to infiltrate it. Now in the Hebrew canon, Ezra and Nehemiah are essentially the same book. They're treated as two halves of the same book. Look with me, please, to the book of Ezra. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached the Ruvavel and the heads of the father's households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we like you seek your God. We've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esad Hadon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. <laughs> They intended the Israelites no good. When they couldn't stop them, although they tried desperately, they play the brother card. Yes. 
Now remember, we're told seven times in the New Testament that the temple is the church. Oikos, Hegios, Naos, Heron, etc. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua, not Jesus, a different Yeshua. And the rest of the heads of the father's house, in verse 3, household of Israel, said to them, You've nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. Now we've explained about King Cyrus in the past, how he is a major type of Christ, even though he was a Persian Gentile. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about and want to explain briefly? All right, we'll do that in a moment. My apologies to the rest of you who know it. Now let's look at this. In the days of Esar Haddon, king of Assyria, when the Assyrians captured the ten northern tribes and took them into captivity, they left a certain number who intermarried with the Assyrian invaders, combining paganism with Judaism. These became the Samaritans. A number of them still exist in Israel today on Mount Gerizim in the West Bank and in the suburbs of Tel Aviv at a place called Halon. There's only a few hundred of them, but they still exist. They didn't accept the full word of God. They only accepted a bad translation of the Torah to support Mount Gerizim being the holy mountain instead of Mount Zion. This is the background to John 4. Anyway. We're like you. We worship the same God. Let us build together. We have to unite. We should be one. I once had a very ignorant woman and her husband, who was as ignorant as she was, they were conference speakers at a house church conference in the Carolinas a number of years ago. And they were very ecumenical, and their whole thing was, Jesus prayed we would be one in the high priestly prayer. Yeah, read it. He prefaces his prayer that we would be one, so the world would believe, by saying, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. You cannot be one with people who do not believe the truth. If an angel of God comes with a different gospel, don't believe them. If anybody comes with a different gospel, they are anathema, accursed of God. If you believe salvation comes by sacraments, an ex opere operato ritual, and atoning for your own sins in purgatory, that your family and friends can get you out with by buying mass cards, that's a different gospel. That's accursed. It's accursed of God. Let us build together. You got nothing to do with us. You have nothing to do with us. You see, the, in England, we have the Alpha Courses, which they said was a door into the Toronto experience in their newspaper, the Alpha Times, in a very ecumenical church. And the leader, Nicky Gumbel, is friends with the Pope's personal chaplain, Renero Cantamalisa. And they're all, oh, we're going to build together. You're going to get born again Saved by Jesus and continue to worship bread and wine as Christ incarnate. Then you're going to say he dies sacramentally and you're going to eat him in a cannibalistic ritual called the Mass. Then you're going to say Mary is the co-mediatrix, she co-redeemed us. You're going to pray to the dead and commit the sin of necromancy. You're going to believe salvation is by rituals and by paying for your own sin in purgatory by believing in other gospels. But that's all right. We're going to be one. Talk to an ex-Catholic. Talk to somebody saved out of the Roman church. It's the same thing with Christians who have this infatuation with Talmudic Judaism. Talk to an Orthodox Jew like David Nathan who was saved out of it. 
They'll tell you that it's not Judaism, it's rabbinism. An ex-Catholic will tell you Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. It's the mystery religions of ancient Babylon. It's the pontifical religions of ancient Rome masquerading as Christianity. It combines the two. It combines the pagan with the scriptural. And it's a hybrid. God hates the mixture. Hot water, cold water, but lukewarm, he spits it out, he said. The Hebrews could not make a garment of wool and flax. Este es muy verdad. Marcella, ¿verdad? En México también nosotros tenemos un problema grande con la iglesia católica. Contra los cristianos. ¿Verdad? That's right. Well, let's look at this. They play the ecumenical card. We're going to build together. We're going to do all this stuff. He's got a good name. Look with me, please. To Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And in those days, many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by the oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arach, his son Yehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Oh boy. You've got intermarriage. Personal relationships now come into play. We'll come back to this in a moment. I told the people who don't know about Kirush Agadol, King Cyrus the Great, that I would explain it. I'm, again, my apologies to those who do. Turn with me, please, very briefly to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 44. We have no chapter division in the original canon. Verse 28. Isaiah 44, verse 28. It is I, Yahweh, who says of Cyrus, Kirush, he is my shepherd. Cyrus is the one who issued the mandate for the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem. Ro'i, definite possessive article in Hebrew, Ro'i. Psalm 23, Yehovah Ro'i, Yahweh, the Lord is my shepherd. This guy is called my shepherd. He is the personal shepherd of Yahweh. He will perform all my desire. He does the will of Yahweh. He declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. restores Jerusalem and temple. Thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, possessive article, Beshicho, Mashiach, Messiah. Cyrus is called his Messiah. 
his anointed one. Whom I've taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him. To loose the loins of kings. To open doors before him that gates will not be shut. He rules by the right hand of Yahweh. All power and dominion. That is in the known world at that time. Was given to him. And when he opens. No one closes. Now who does that look like? Although he was a Persian, he is one of the most important types of Christ in the Old Testament. Jesus is the shepherd of Yahweh. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my Father. In the millennium, will restore Jerusalem and the temple, won't he? Jesus is the Lord's anointed one, Messiah. Jesus rules by the right hand of Yahweh. Jesus has all power and dominion. And when Jesus opens, no man closes. Amen. Pay attention. This was written 200 years before, uh, Isaiah, before Cyrus was born. And it names him. Liberal scholars have a hard time with that, despite the Dead Sea Scrolls. So therefore they say, well, there's no God, even if there is, he doesn't know the future. And even if he did, he wouldn't have told Isaiah. So therefore, Isaiah didn't write the book of Isaiah. <laughs> That's what they'll teach you, you know, at the Yale Divinity School or something like that. Even though Yale Divinity School and Princeton and these places were actually founded by believers, such it is. Cyrus issued the decree to rebuild the temple, as we read about in Nehemiah and Ezra. But it was him who destroyed and defeated Babylon, the Babylonian conquest of the Jews. The Persians get rid of them and then send the Jews back. We deal with this on our recording, Iran and Prophecy. After the shore went, the peacock throne of Cyrus disappeared, and the principality you see in Daniel 10, the mad angel, takes over. Anyway, that's what's happening now, but I just mentioned that in passing. Okay, The way that Cyrus got rid of Babylon is a picture of the way that Jesus will get rid of Babylon the Great. You understand? The way that Cyrus got rid of Babylon and restored the temple in Jerusalem is the way that Jesus will depose Babylon the Great and restore the temple in Jerusalem in the millennial reign. One is a type, a shadow of the other. Everybody understand why Ezra and Nehemiah are going on about Cyrus. Cyrus is a big deal in prophecy. And there are events happening in the world today that herald back to the historical importance prophetically This week in the Middle East, and go back to Cyrus, this battle in Iran. Nonetheless, again, I know a lot of you know this. Let's go back now to Nehemiah. So we read. Many in Judah, in verse 18 of chapter 6, were bound by an oath to him. He was the son-in-law of Shechaniah. Turn with me, please, to Ezra, I'm sorry, to Nehemiah chapter 13. Verse 
Verse 23. In those days I also saw that Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. As in the New Testament, avoid marriage with non-believers. Verse 28, even one of the sons of Jehoiada, the priest, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat, the Hordonite. So I drove him away from me. What was happening here, reinforced even by marriage to non-believers, was this. Personal and family loyalties eclipsed loyalty to the word of God. Personal and family loyalties eclipsed loyalty to the word of God. When people are not loyal to the word of God, no matter what they say, no matter how much they protest, they are not loyal to the Lord. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. They are not loyal to the word of God. You will find today churches that are dividing over doctrinal and moral issues, relationships predominate within the politics of the church. It's all theocratic politics where it's a relationship issue, not a doctrinal issue. Well, my children like the youth group, and I'm afraid they won't go to church if we go to leave that plan. <laughs> but all my friends go there, my business associates, and you know, professional colleagues. You know. But look what they're doing. Look what they're going. You, you, well, I know it's not right, but we know it'll upset too many relationships within the family if we do. How many people have encountered things like that? Look around. <laughs> It becomes a relationship issue, you understand? Even a family issue. In the last days, this becomes amplified. Remember what Jesus said? Children will turn against parents, parents against children even. This is going to be a big deal the closer we get to the return of Jesus. People are going to allow relationships to others. Basically, in an act of subterfuge, undermine the relationship with the Lord on the basis of his word. People are going to compromise with things they know that are wrong and cannot scripturally be defended for the sake of relationships. And there's a whole strata of church politics that comes, on, comes along with it. There's no end to it. It gets hopeless. With this in view, let us read, please, chapter 13 of Nehemiah. On that day, they read aloud from the book of Moses, that is the Torah, and the hearing of the people. And there was found written in that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. Because they did not meet the sons of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it came about that when they heard of the law, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. The only way to deal with the Moabites is on God's terms. Remember Ruth, a Moabitess? She converted to the one true faith and the one true God. Your people will be my people because your God is my God. They reject their false beliefs. If somebody is not willing to break with a false religious system, 
It doesn't matter what it is. If you can believe it, you have evangelical leaders, people I, who are once very respected by people I know who are looking for rapprochements with the Mormons. People like Ravi Zacharias. Boy, has that guy lost his way. Now, you've got to reject that stuff. Jesus is not the spirit brother of Satan. Black people are not the descendants of fallen angels. There's not Quakers living on the moon. You've got to reject the Mormons. It's all nuts. You've got evangelicals looking for Ray Proshman with more. No. No two Gospels could be less compatible than the Gospel of Rome and the Gospel of Jesus. Transubstantiation is based on Aristotle's philosophies. There is nothing more contradictory to the teaching of the Judeo-Christian scriptures than Aristotelian philosophy. It's even further than Platonic philosophy. There it is. You've got to stop believing it. They were always your enemies and they always will be. Nosotros tenemos provincias en México con persecución de los cristianos, pentecostales y baptistas, de la iglesia católica, ¿verdad? There are provinces in rural Mexico, today, where the Roman Catholic Church is actively engaged in the persecution of born-again Christians from evangelical churches, mainly Baptists and Pentecostals. Today! The media doesn't talk about it much. It's not politically correct. It doesn't fit the agenda. It's not part of the narrative being propagated. The Opus Dei and these things are very active in Latin America against believers in many countries. What the Peronistas in Argentina did to, is verdad? He's from Argentina. What the Peronistas, the Peronists did in Argentina to the Christians? If you're American, you get arrested and deported. Good luck to the local evangelists. They're always going to be your enemy. That just changed strategy. Remember, the dragon becomes a serpent. The dragon becomes a serpent. Remember Jesus told the serpent, you're going to crawl on your stomach? Obviously, the serpent was a quadruped, or a, at least a, a biped or a quadruped. They had legs before they were cursed. <laughs> the dragon turns into a serpent. But it's the same creature, just a different mode of attack. Now let's look at verse 4 through verse 9 very, very carefully. Now prior to this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chamber of the house of our God, being related to Tobiah. Oh boy. The two honchos were very close friends. Had prepared a large room for him, where formally, formally, they put the grain offerings the frankincense, the utensils and the tithes of grain, wine and oil, prescribed for the Levites, the singers and the gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priest. Once you bring Tobiah in, what is the incense? Revelation 8, the prayers of the saints. Ezekiel 13 in prayers. The Levitical worship established by the Lord in the Torah. The Levitical worship stops. Authentic worship stops when you bring in Tobiah. Oh, 
Israel, we have an ecumenical interfaith procession. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Ave Maria, Ave Maria. True story, I had a friend who was a born-again Catholic, charismatic, nice guy named Gregory in Haifa, Israel, lived on Mount Carmel. He was a Carmelite monk. Nice guy! Came to our Friday night meetings. He was one of us. Then, once a year, they take this statue of Mary from Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel was a site of Ashtoreth worship, the female cult deity in Old Testament times. Only now they don't call her Ashtoreth. They call her Hail Mary full of grace, but it's the same bimbo. <laughs> Not to be confused with the mother of Jesus. They take her to this church in the middle of Haifa in a procession down the mountain. They carry the statue, and they got the incense and the candles and the flowers, and they're singing off Emir. There's my friend Gregory with us Friday night. Hallelujah, hallelujah, beautiful. But then Sunday, Ave Maria tree, it's good to see you. He's walking on back of the statue with the rest of the idolaters. Praying to the dead. If you haven't heard me say this, I'll say it again, because I like to offend people. Huh? <laughs> at, least I'm, at least that's what I'm accused of. There was a wonderful Jewish girl, about 15 probably. Her name was Miriam. She had dark hair, dark complexion, dark eyes. And she was the greatest woman who ever lived. Echoing the song of Deborah from the book of Judges, chapter 5, the angel Gabriel, Gavriel, the mighty one of God in Hebrew, told her she's going to be the mother of the Mashiach, the Messiah who would save his people from their sin. This is the greatest woman who ever lived. And the greatest woman who ever lived, when she was told she was the greatest woman who ever lived, the first words out of her mouth. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. First words out of her mouth, she needed a Savior. Oh no! Munificentissimus Deus! Mary conceived without sin. She had no sin. Who do I believe? Mary or the Pope? Personally, I believe Miriam. Her name was not Mary. It was Miriam. She was the greatest woman who ever lived. And if she tells me she needs a savior, I believe her. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. I don't believe Miriam would lie. And even if she did, God wouldn't have put it in his word. <laughs> but she didn't lie. She told the truth. She was the greatest woman who ever lived. I love Miriam. I esteem Miriam. I think Miriam is fantastic. I think Miriam is terrific. I greatly look forward one day to meeting Miriam. But I don't want anything to do with that stupid, dumb, blonde, bimbo, shiksa, imposter, Mary. That's just Diana of Ephesus and Minerva and all the rest of the female cult deities imitating Mary. Miriam, a nice Jewish girl. She didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes. Not that I have anything against blondes. <laughs> My daughter's a nice Jewish girl who is a blonde. I had a design to look like a Norwegian in case of a pogrom. <laughs> you understand? They're incompatible with us. Real worship cannot take place. Do this in remembrance of me. Zota Sula Zikroni. It comes from a Passover Seder. He doesn't die again sacramentally. That bread and wine is not Jesus incarnate that you worship as God. That's idolatry. 
And then you if, if, eat it, if they think it's protoplasmic Jesus under the appearance of bread and wine, that's cannibalism. We drink his blood. The apostle said, don't drink blood in Acts 15. If it was his real blood, why are you drinking it? What are you, Dracula? <laughs> it's a cannibalistic vampire superstition. Are there any ex-Catholics here, saved out of the Roman church, who disagree with what I said or who take exception to it? Does every ex-Catholic in here agree with what I said? Yes. That's right. I can show you priests, nuns, who were saved by Jesus will tell you the same thing I did. My friends were Jesuits, Dominicans who came to know the Lord. My friend Bridget O'Neill was a nun 34 years in Ireland. She'll tell you the same things I'm telling you. Let's go. Real worship goes out the window. Verse 6. But during all this time I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had gone to the king after some time. However, I asked leave from the king. Artaxerxes, king of Babylon. Artashasta in Hebrew and Aramaic. And I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashiv had done for Tobiah by preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. The problem is not just Tobiah. The problem is the high priest who brings him in. The problem is not the pope. The problem of the evangelicals who bring him in. <coughs> Sambalat's always going to be Sambalat. Gershom's always going to be Gershom. And Tobiah's always going to be Tobiah. The constitutional motto of the Roman church is sempre eden, always the same. They may change strategies, but they don't change what they are. Leopards do not change their spots. Let us look. Verse 8, it was very displeasing to me. So I threw out all of Tobias' household goods out of the room. Then I gave an order and they cleansed the rooms and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. If we're not going to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, we're not going to worship him at all. He won't accept it. The house has to be purified. All of this junk has to be thrown out. Tobiah must be evicted. But it's not just good enough to evict Tobiah. We've got to confront Eli Ashib, our own leaders, our own clergy, who go down the ecumenical road, who go down the interfaith road. Again, organizations like Youth with a Mission are absolutely disgusting and reprehensible. I have shown this to Calvary Chapel pastors personally. They saw it. They couldn't deny it. They were ex-Catholics themselves. Oh, but I know Danny Lehman. And relationships take precedence. It becomes about the politics of relations with other people instead of the relationship with the Lord. Truth, doctrine, the word of God goes out the window. First, it's on the back burner. Then, out the window. Give the room to Tobiah. Bring it in here. What do you end up with? A defiled temple. It's not enough to evict Tobiah. That's the beginning. You've got to confront the one who brought him in. You've got to confront the one who brought him in. 
It's just the way it is. God puts these things in his word for a reason. These things are important. It's just the way it is. Now look. Again, the Holy Spirit is doing something new. Although the Barna reports and the other one uh, show that church attendance is going down in America, it's gone way down in Britain and so forth, there's something they can't calculate. More and more people are meeting in homes. <laughs> the situation is not as bad as what they're making it out to be. It's not that people are not going to church. It's just that people are not going to a defiled temple anymore. <laughs> They'd rather meet in a tent in the middle of a field than in a building where Jesus is no longer being worshipped in spirit and in truth. That's the reality. That's the way it was. That's what's going on now. If we're going to get anywhere, if we're going to do anything, we've got to clean the house out. Eliashiv, the clergy who bring this stuff in, must be confronted. And Tobiah must be evicted. God bless and thank you.